Welcome to the Smart Nonsense Podcast, where we talk about entrepreneurship, self-development, and challenging norms. Today, it's... Who knows what episode? This is a bonus episode. We're getting it right out there, because this book just dropped. Money, the true story of a made-up thing by Jacob Goldstein. A dude, I've been following for a while on NPR's podcast, Planet Money. I have not. There's a dog barking. We should go just kick it out of the building. That's that's uh, how it goes. So it's, what do you know about Jacob Goldstein? Because I know literally nothing. This was a beautiful, beautiful book of history. I hate history. I figured out why, but this book gets it right. He, I don't know. I just been following him on Planet Money. He got into that world. He mentions it a little bit in the beginning of the book. But it's just, he, he dissects it in the way he tells stories. It's so entertaining with breaking down everything from the very advent of money to modern day and cryptocurrency. And like future. like we've talked about being casual about it, mm. being casual. One of my favorite things he did was he was talking about this guy named Irving Fisher, and we'll get to the, that at some point. But what he says, at some point in the book, he calls him Irving Dam Fisher. And he was like, our man, Irving Fisher. And I just thought like that speaks to how good of a storyteller Jacob is. Um, I realized I hate history because it's not something I like to do, which is just like memorize facts. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because when you came in to talk about this book, you're like trying to pick things out and dates and names. And I just don't like history. I like when it's put in such a story, like fairy tale, almost like this. Well, yeah, this, this tells it literally like a story. And that's what I do. Like the reason why I like history is because the last five hours, I've just been pacing around my room, just telling myself the story (laughs) of money. And that's, I'm basically summarizing the job that Jacob did. So if you're into money at all, I think you should read this book. Just into making maybe a boring, traditionally boring subject for many people. Or if you hate money and want to figure out like how we got to the capitalistic place we did. Mm. Basically what he says in the book is this stuff is going to keep happening over and over and over again. We've gone through five, ten different kinds of currency in the world. And uh, we keep coming back to the same place. Maybe cryptocurrency is the answer, but... Yeah, I think we'll get into big takeaways. There are a couple uh, that are interesting. But yeah, you see history repeated. We'll get into China pretty soon. Yeah. And how they basically were ahead of the curve, and then they just dropped right back, and then Standard Eleven just... Like so what I want to do, I want to go through the history, your history buff. Let's mm. do it. And then I want at the end, your Jacob or Goldstein gives three kind <clears throat> of future world possibilities. I meant to mute my mic and cough, but I didn't mute it. <laughs> and so just, I just still coughed. coughed. Yeah. Uh, we love it. Um, but I want to see what you think about the end of the book in terms of moving forward and, and best options. I think there were three. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get into that. That's the tail end. Uh, so we got to go way Take back. Take us into the history. Back way to the back. Greeks, I mean, right? Before, before that. The Greeks, Bill. Mm. So let's go. It, the book starts, right? And we're first trying to talk about how we invented money. Like it's, it's not necessarily natural. Actually, interesting thing I didn't think about before, but you ever hear about that video with capuchin monkeys? We, we talked about capuchin monkeys. No, but monkeys. I love capuchin monkeys. Capuchin monkeys. They, scientists introduced money into their ecosystem by like basically giving them, I forget, like some sort of like berry or fruit or something. something. And they started using it and creating commerce. And then very quickly, almost immediately, prostitution started. So one would give grapes to the female and the female would just sit there and he'd just go to town. We should have talked about this with Emma on her mom. Well, Emma's mom being a sex anthropologist. I didn't know capuchins did that. I didn't until I watched the video. We'll link the video. I'll have to find it. But Oh, this is going to come out before Emma. Stay tuned. True, true. That's like 10 episodes later, so you got to really stay tuned. But uh, so the idea of money, like where does it come from? If we go back, like let, let's think, most people think like, oh, what happened before money? Oh, there was this little barter, barter. system. That's like the go-to. And it's not entirely wrong, but like if I go to you, Henry, and I'm like, Henry, can you, um, I don't know, you have some cameras. Can I trade you? some sheep because <laughs> i own sheep six sheep seven pigs a computer mouse right and a i just stick. get all this stuff and i give it to you sure and sure. now i value stuck, that sure kind of but you have all this stuff like say you have sheep and you have like herbs and i don't know wheat and stuff like that and it's like too much like what are you gonna do you're gonna have and when i go to turn around and 
barter with somebody else, they might not want the sheep I have right. Right. and it's, the computer mouse that I got utility from. It's just obnoxious. It's, it's, it's so obnoxious. So <laughs> your your options are basically, well, take your little wheat or whatever sheep eat, feed that to the sheep, and then you're basically just sustaining a sheep until you're hungry enough to eat it all. It's just a messy system. So what actually happened wasn't this barter system or as much of a barter system. It was gifts. It was... Hey, I just got all this shit, guys. Uh, let's throw a party. Let's just ball out. Everyone comes in. You can eat the sheep. I also got some cows that we can just go to town on. Whatever they had. I don't know. I'm making up animals now. But they would just throw a party. And then you have these sort of internal IOUs. of Like, oh, they gave me a gift before. Once I get a bunch of stuff, I'll invite them. I'll give them some jewelry or whatever it is I have. So that was society back then. And it worked when you had little villages. I was going to say, I could get behind that, just in our friends. It's like, well, I'll grab dinner today, you grab it tomorrow. We talked about this. Uh, that's a whole different matter. But the cost of having to pay for something, completely mm. separate. But only one person in a group of five should bear it. But yeah, that, digress, please. I, I think there's a lot of psychology. I know in, oh, why do I always forget the name? Influence by Cialdini, where he talks about reciprocity. And say, I forget the religious people, but they give you like flowers and they do that because they know they get a lot more money in return. So it's just, that's the way that people function internally is just reciprocity. So basically it works in villages, your little Dunbar number. Once you get beyond 150, then it gets dangerous. And when, when Belki, do we have the start of real cities? You, you hinted, but this was a little bit later. Was it Greece? Said. Greece is like the second one. But the, the OG cities, there you go. That fertile crescent, baby. Fertile crescent. So we have the Fertile Crescent, right? It's nice and fertile. You can sustain more people. I love it. So you get in and you're like, all right, it's too much of IOUs to keep track of, too many people. So what they end up doing is creating these little like clay balls with like inscribed little, uh, like basically like a little piece of paper, ledger. I don't know. It wasn't paper, whatever they used. And that was like, all right, now I know that I owe him. And they like leave it at your front door, right? You just come and like etch the IOU on the clay tab and I, I don't know exactly how they put it on the tab. Basically, yeah, you got your tab and it's going around. Then they took out the clay balls because it didn't make sense. But they started with IOUs. Mm -hmm. And that was the foundation of some sort of currency, how we know it. Uh, not really how we know it today, but currency in the traditional sense. But uh, it doesn't evolve much beyond that. 4,000 years later, we still got IOUs. Yeah, it, everything's pretty much just IOUs. It's just like different forms yeah, later in the book it's called uh, shadow banking basically right so all this stuff moving around behind the scenes but nobody really has anything it's it's all this whole trust uh, i trust that this is worth something oh he says the first writers were accountants yes i always thought they were mathematicians the egyptians whomever whoever i do this every time um they were accountants yeah that's kind of cool yeah it's like why did you need writing well OG writing was like, hey, this this dude owes me shit. So that's where it starts. But then, I don't know, it doesn't really grow beyond that until we get to Greece. And Greece is rocking and rolling, I think, 2,500 years ago, so call it 500 BC. That's when we're cranking. And they got their little polises, right? Their little, like, met metropolis. So they got, they got their little Greek cities. And they hear uh, these people in modern-day Turkey. And they're called the Lydians. Yes, I like right? the Lydians. The Lydians, those cheeky people bats they start taking their little gold and silver alloy and they're like let's just make a little clump of it throw a lion stamp on it and we can use that this is how it happened there, there you go. go this is how it happened another quick interesting tidbit that i didn't know but you see it in museums like they've got holes in the coins that was can so you wait i'm sorry there yet, I'm, so I'm sorry it's so cool that's I'm actually just dragging okay. these around well we're, we're going to talk about Greece for a second, okay, okay, but also okay. simultaneously China's working on that stuff. So we'll get to that. All right. We're going to be here for six hours then. This is going to be really long, but I love it. Okay. So we have the Lydians. Uh, they, they do their thing and the Greeks are like, oh, that's the shit. Let's start getting our own little coin system going. So they do as well. And it just pops off. Like normally in Greece, everything was feudal. So it would be like, oh, I don't have much money. So I'm going to work on Henry's farm. And you'll give me a little bit of food. I can crash. And you're, you're in like these one-year contracts of just living there. But now they come in and they have money. And it turns into this not feudal society, but this market society where, 
oh, I'm just going to be like a day worker, come help you on the farm, but then I'm going to go back to my house and just chill. Maybe I'll go to these little agoras, I think they're called, just gathering places. Yeah, agora. Agoras, yeah, thank you. Of uh, how you say it, but something like that. That's how it's going to get mad. <laughs> yeah, and so that's where they used to have speeches, but now it turns into a market naturally. So basically, Greece is just flourishing with all this commerce now. But then they, I don't know, they they drop the ball and just get, I don't know, I, I forget why Greece drops off the map. They'll come back later on. I don't know, but what I found was really interesting oh. was Aristotle. He was around this time, mm. whatever BC year. And uh, he was getting so mad as a philosopher that with the advent of coin, immediately people started measuring wealth in how many coins they had, how much mm. finance. And that kind of drove him crazy. And I think two, 3,000 years later, we're still at the same point. What about your health as wealth, your happiness as wealth? Um, Aristotle was mad then. We're kind of bitter about it now. You, you can't stop it. It's just human nature. It, yeah. You just like it's all monkey this, nature, apparently. Right. Just capuchins. So they have their little system going on in Greece. Around the same time, we're getting into the hold coins in China. Yes. So China, China comes up with their little currency system. In those days, they started with bronze. Wait, I didn't get to make my point. You're about to. The coins with the holes in them? You're about that to. that Lydia? No. Oh, maybe Lydia too, but it mentioned China. Okay, in the book. okay, go ahead. So China, they have their bronze coins, and bronze isn't worth capooch all right <laughs> it's not worth anything and so you need a bunch of them you need a sleeve of a thousand of them yes. to be worth anything so how do you carry around yes. a thousand thank you. bronze coins thank you you poke a hole in them and you put them on a string and you just drag around a thousand pounds of bronze or or you get those little candy necklaces and you just chew on little bronze look at that that actually i kinda... was confused it i understand bronze is worth nothing why couldn't they just like do some economics and like shift prices around maybe so that they needed three bronze coins instead of a thousand pounds worth. Well, let's think this through. No, we don't have time to don't have time for it. There we go. No thought on this one. Think yourself in the off period. All right. So we have these giant sleeves. It weighs like seven pounds to just have yeah. like the, Up the to buy an egg unit. to buy right. a loaf of bread. And it's just a pain in the butt. So they're dealing with that. And then, meantime, we get a, a couple of inventions that are going to change the way the world works, at least in China. So what happens about 100 AD, so 2,000 years ago, uh, in China? Goldsmiths? Nope. Mm. Wrong. <laughs> I was going to say light, because that was a really interesting part of the book. Do you not there yet. Not there. I know, not there, but that graph. We're talking, talking about 2,000 years ago, and we're... Jesus Christ. All right, so 100. That's when... This little bicho, he just gets some some trees and he starts mashing them up, put them on a screen, drying them out, and he makes paper. Who's he? This little Chinese dude. Oh. I don't, maybe he's big. Okay. People were small back then. They this were Chinese smaller. dude. And so he makes paper and then another 600 years later, uh, a bunch of Buddhist Chinese monks got tired of oh. writing all these little uh, the code check. scriptures. Yeah. And they're like, okay, let's make a little stamp. So they can just ink this stuff. And now, 200 years later, about 900, that's when they come and they create the coat check. The coat check. Bucky, do you want to explain the coat check or do you want me? You can do it, but uh, go ahead. So we have these technologies, right, Bucky? We have basically the, the building box for paper currency, but that doesn't exist yet. So what happens is all these big sleeves, these little uh, candy necklaces of, of, at this point, it was iron that they were using. Yeah, that's they, right. They, they have them, and it's like, I don't want to lug this shit around. It's heavy, and I'm weak. Like, you don't feed me. How am I supposed to carry this? So then you get these little merchants that are like, hey, uh, I'll just hang on to your coins and give you a little slip that's like, hey, uh, Belky the merchant has all my coins, and then you can trade that. So there, it just, from nowhere. And so anyone can exchange these coat check receipts. I'm wigg wiggling the cameras. And you can exchange them and then go to a bank or whatever, turn in your receipt, and ostensibly you get your bronze or your iron back. Mm. This is when the trust begins. Yeah, and it's funky because uh, th you have these little IOUs circulating now, and it's, it's paper version now. So it's pretty easy to replicate and to forge. 
So they're they're getting pissed. The Chinese are like, you know what? I'm sick of this. They start like really cracking down and, and penalizing people. But it just absolutely goes through the moon when some dudes from up north come riding on their high horses. You the know, Mongols, who, baby. the Mongols, Genghis Khan. In comes Genghis Khan, yes. and there there are a bunch of these clowns that just love living the nomadic life. So they take over pretty much all of Asia and into Europe. And they don't want to be lugging around this coinage. So guess who loves paper currency? The Mongols. <laughs> so the Mongols just eat this shit up. Genghis Khan Genghis loves it. Kubla, baby. Exactly. They keep printing. Uh, they, or they make it, etc. But there's this big issue. And, and so Genghis' grandson, Kubla Khan, he loves it. They actually make it. They're like, you know what? Screw all the coinage. We're only going paper. But they're greedy. They're greedy. They're like, you know, we're trying to take over the world. We get the Japanese. We want to kick their ass right now. So we need some funds. And then, you know, you cave into the printing. So you just start printing yeah. money. And then it, it just turns into mayhem. And know what's funny, Belky? You know when they talked about what the printing money looked like? It was before. Okay, so before it have like a an image of like a bronze coin or whatever coins on the the currency and it have like a figure of how much. But they're just like, you know what? Fuck it. This isn't worth anything. Let's just put the coins on here, but it's not denominated as anything. You can't redeem it for anything. It's just a picture. So it's literally fake. It's literally fake news and currency. And it was it caused like some chaos for a little bit, but then people were just like, all right, this is what we're doing now. That's the thing about money. You you keep getting mirages of it through the whole book it's nothing it's literally nothing it's just unless we're talking about the gold standard but um it's all just the fact that people believe and trust their institutions in this case trusting genghis and kubla khan bad idea um but whatever you believe it to be like that's what it is for 10 hundred years yeah it's literally i think that's one of the main themes of the book is just like it's just whatever we believe is money is going to be money. Especially they actually mentioned too, Jacob mentions how basically whatever the government is going to collect taxes with is going to turn into the money. Hmm. So that's, that's what all the Chinese government started doing. And later on when we get to these major financial crises, it only takes one person saying like one sentence to calm people down to get them. In one case, it was Franklin Roosevelt, his fireside chat on the radio. And the other one, it was the something or other of the EU who said, we'll oh, make the it Italian work. dude that went to MIT. Do you agree or something? The time? Yeah. It's literally just like, we just need confidence. Yeah, like it's all, we'll yeah. talk about bank runs and stuff like that, but it's only because you get nervous because you're like, oh, one bank collapsed. And then once the herd goes in a direction, everybody's screwed. So basically, uh, China was ripping. The Mongols were tearing it up with, uh, I guess, their slash and burn society but also with their money but then this dude comes in we got hong Wu, and he hong Wu's he just he hates this, this shit he, he's the start of the ming dynasty okay. and th so they go from this sort of more capitalistic uh, government basically to more communist and it's just like hey we're going back screw the money screw the paper money it's just gonna be you pay us in cloth and grain oh that's right so china actually ditches paper currency for a long time and they go back towards the bar. Well, China world. was the shit. 1200, Jacob says, like, there was no better place in the world technologically. The size of the city, they had multiple cities over a million. Meanwhile, like Paris or whatever in Europe, just there was half the size, if that. So they were crushing it. And then they just revert back. And can you imagine, like, us going back to 1800s living? Gold. It's just, just like exchanging. It's just, just going back to living in the woods and, like, growing our own shit to not die. Um, so it's it's an amazing world. We'll cut it pretty soon. But the the cool takeaway was Marco Polo from Europe. He goes over in 1271 and he's like, what the fuck? They're using paper money? What the shit is this? Because everyone's just like, gold is the shit. Gold and silver, that's everything. And then they see them tossing around tree bark as money with little pictures on it. It's It's ludicrous. And he comes back 25 years later, writes his book, and that's a chapter in it. And no one believes him. Yeah. It's just absurd. So Europe, they have their gold and their silver, Belki. But what's the problem when you're using gold and silver as money? The weights, no? The, the composition 
<clears throat> the alloys you're choosing to use right. are the issue. So say right now uh, you, you go down and you're, you're trying to get a little Taco Bell. And you go to Taco Bell with your little 10 silver coin. And they're like, dog, that shit, that shit's not real. That's, that's like $7 of silver right there. You're like, no, that's 10 That's every single time you go to use your money. So it's just an absolute annoying, mind-boggling situation. So here comes the goldsmiths. Yes. You want to talk about the goldsmiths? Well, the goldsmiths, they're like, this is super annoying. In order to, to handle your, your transactions and these coat checks, right, we're going to start charging interest. Kind of. Well, they, yeah, they're basically doing the coat check where they're like, okay, you give us your gold, your silver, whatever. We'll make sure like it's right, the right, right amount. Give you a little slip. And now the slips are going around and like, that's what we talked about in China before just now. It's happening in Europe. But they get even crazier, right? And that's when they're like, oh, well, we have these slips. What if we make a loan? Mm. So now they're like, hey, I'll give you a slip because you need money right now. Like that catch-22 of, oh, you need money to make money? Exactly. I'll give you the money. When you make the money, you come and repay me a little bit with interest, like you said. So that's when it just gets into this fractional reserve banking. That's the start. It's getting tricky. But I, I, this is like 1600s. So it, it's, you got to realize like if you give $10 to a bank, they don't just keep that money in reserve in the back in the vault. They're going to give that out immediately. Maybe they'll keep like 10%. But whatever their reserve amount is, say it's 10%, that every single bank is going to do. So your $10 is now going to turn into $100 in the market. Yes. And there's this new problem that, no more do you have to go to a goldsmith with your gold and your silver to get your coat check. You can go to a goldsmith and take out a loan by promising them that you'll pay them back in the future. You don't have to have any assets to begin with. It's a dangerous world. Dangerous world. And then guess what? You got those little Amsterdamies. I don't know what they're actually called. But up, where's that? The Netherlands? Something like that. The Dutch. Let's call them the Dutch. Deutsche. So the Dutch, they start getting into the first multinational company. You know the name of that company, Belky? East, East Indian Trade Company? Something like Dutch, that. Something, something East Dutch India Trade. East India Company, sure. They, they have their own word. We abbreviate it VOC. So the yes. VOC, this Dutch East India Company, that is I the I want to try and read it off. Keep going. Okay. So basically, back then, you know, the world is, is massive. We're just starting to discover it. Their spices, they love their spices. So they're trying to send ships and come back with a bunch of spices, some gold, some silver, whatever they can find. The problem is half of them don't come back. Like It's a risky venture, and you need all this money. So they create the Dutch create this East India Company where suddenly investors can come in and say, hey, I'm going to buy a stock in your ship, and if your ship makes it back, I'm going to make out like a bandit with all these goodies. Yep. If it doesn't, it sinks, it gets eaten by cannibals. Well, I'm out of luck. So amazingly, this is the stock market coming to fruition back in 1604 in Deutschland. And so what, what happens is it's kind of funny because you have the first I can't exchange. Okay, well, you're useless. I know. You have people that are like, oh, I have stock in, call it the Mayflower, mm -hmm. whatever ship it is. And you're like, all right, uh, I, I need money right now. I have the stock. Belky, can you, you want to trade you with me? Yeah. Right. So we'll go, we'll meet on this little bridge, and we'll exchange. So you give me the money, I'll give you my stock. That's the first stock exchange. Yeah. And what's kind of funny, I'll just mention it quickly, is you have these exchanges, but say like, I need money at 9 p.m., and it's open 24 hours, it's hard to find somebody. That's what they call a thin now market. We, right. So you're like, all right, market hours, two hours in the morning, we'll break for lunch, we'll come back for another hour, that's when we trade. So now we've got trading hours in 160 whatever, four. Right. Trading hours... That's, that's why nuts. you can't trade after hours these days on the stocks because yeah. um, that's where the thick market comes from. So, bam, we have that little stock exchange springing into action. At the same time, it talks about probability. Jacob talks about probability. Yeah, yeah. the problem with the points, that's which kind I, of I thought was really cool. It was the first time ever that people basically use math to predict the future. I was <laughs> kind of confused that it wasn't until this point that... What were they playing? It was like a little dice game? It they was, playing poker, it was like, basically. Yeah, like picture even just flipping coins. Yeah. I think the example is like, all right, say we're going to do three coin flips, right? And I win the first one. Right. 
And now we're like, all right, at this point in the game, what are the odds that I'm going to win? And then you take your payout. Right, right. So it's like a, whatever, you stop in the middle of the game. And they just had no idea. <laughs> They're like, what the rocket science shit is this? We can't do that math. And they just, <laughs> oh, it's probably even. Like, they have no clue. Right, right. And then in comes... Uh, what a world to live in. <sighs> Literally just rolling just dice. Craziness. Just- and well, I guess we'll connect it to the problem with the government in a second. But basically, like they had annuities, like raising money for the yeah. government was tricky. So annuity is like, uh, say Dylan or Henry pays the government a hundred, like a hundred thousand dollars or something. Consider it life insurance. It's the opposite. Well, it was the early version of it. It is the opposite. Yeah. So basically, they'll give me like uh, a fraction of it, so like two thousand dollars a year while I live. Correct. And it's basically like me thinking I'm going to outlive the government. But the government was like, we're going to give you the same amount no matter how much how old you are. And so it's like, why not just give it to a 10-year-old exactly. who has like 60 years exactly. of whatever the life is. So was. grandparents start signing up their grandchildren for right. annuities. And then the government's like, fuck. So it's just chaos. And this guy, they, what is it? John Law. John Law. John Law comes in and he starts, he's like, the math is just screwed up. We have Pascal and another guy, I forget. They come and prove the math like, hey, uh, if there are two more coin flips, three out of four, I'm going to win because I won the first one. And that blows everyone's mind. Now he's making money gambling. And then he goes to France because he, he like got in a duel, murdered some dude. England didn't like him. <laughs> he's had to leave like six countries. <laughs> he's, a, he's a maniac. <laughs> so he goes to France and he, he befriends this dude that soon becomes the regent, which is basically yeah. like the, the king was too young. He's like five. So this dude comes to power. And France... France then, he's like, oh, I want to create basically the Federal Reserve, like a one national bank. And everyone's laughing. I'm like, dude, this national bank, like it's a joke. But then the regent's like, nah, dude, I'm going to put some money in your little bank and then tell everybody this is what we're doing now. This is how I'm going to collect taxes. And they just start with paper money. So here comes paper money and it's France just crushing it. John Law's a sketchy dude. He kind of turns this into like a super company of now. He's France. like a major gambler too. He's a wild man. Yeah. He's a wild man. He was getting a lot of action, He's the only though. person in the world that knows how probability works. He was like the time. richest <laughs> dude in Europe for some period of time, other than like a king. But uh, France has like Canada, and they own all that Louisiana territory and the Mississippi, and they're just crushing it. And he's like propping up how amazing the returns are there. So everyone's just like pouring money into this bank that's also like a company that has stock. It's madness. The bubble pops, basically, because he gets greedy, and he tries to devalue and uncouple it from gold and silver. So then the France is like, fuck this shit. We're out of here. Kick this dude out again. But it's the start of like a national bank with money. And you have this guy just printing it himself. It's fascinating. That's where it comes to like whatever the government declares they'll collect taxes in. That's usually going to mm-hmm. be the currency. So that's, that's like all of Europe, I think, for the most part. Um, we do have some issues as we get up with like technology and progress and people in general like they don't consider necessarily the real value of money. Like mm-hmm. this is where we get into light. I, I ran some, uh, yeah, we'll get into light, but I ran some interesting calculations just on house values when it comes to thinking about the real value of, of money's worth. But the light graph was pretty amazing. What was it? Oh, uh, there's was a like, graph? I yeah. I oh my, audio hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, tell them about light. I'm going to pull it up. You right. have to see so, this. So light, this is the metric we're using to see how our, our buying power, like real buying power over time has improved. The way they measure it is in one working day, how much light can that get you? And let's go back, say, to Mesopotamia. Or not yeah, Mesopotamia. Let's like, go to uh, Babylon. Babylon was like 3,500 years ago, I think. fat. Yeah. No. Well, not, not there yet. Uh-huh. Babylon had just sesame seeds. Oh, okay. They had their little sesame seeds. You crunch it down. You get some sesame oil. Light that on fire. And you get about 10 minutes of light for one day's work. Yeah. Look at this. There you go. Okay. You want to exp- You want? No, but Let- I, I cannot believe you didn't see this graph because you're I, listening to it's it. It's all in my mind. Okay, go on. Then we go on to whale oil. Then we go on. I got, I got a picture of my house kitchen. You know that? What's that called when you have like locations? Um, like you memorize based Vignettes? on locations? Nope. No. You're an idiot. Okay. Well, whatever. I'm picturing a whale in the kitchen right now. So 1700s okay. comes around and some dude, I don't know who, but stabs a whale and then squeezes a little whale juice out and lights that on fire. And now you got whale oil. And guess what? You get about, what, five hours? One. You one. get one hour. Oh, that's... You work for a whole day, you get one hour of light with whale oil. It's a ripoff. Fast track, they, they come out with kerosene, 
then you get five hours mm. once they're burning kerosene and then mr our, our doggy do mr edison edison what is this 1870 something uh when is he rocking and rolling uh, something like that Call it 1872 because like that. that sounds like a number Got his book up there so he has his little edison electric company mm-hmm. and what's cool there is it's an llc yes for the first time or early it's one of the early, early. llc's and basically before that Say you have a company and you like accidentally kill a bunch of people in an electric fire. If you're an investor, you're on the hook. Yeah. You got to pay all those people. But now you got your limited liability, so you can't. And the United come after. States is thinking we want people to innovate and take risks and own their patents and their monopolies. For them to do that, we have to take some of the risk away from them personally. Mm. And that's how we end up at, at the limited liability corporation. Mm. So yeah, Edison has this company and he gets investors and like they create electricity. And guess what? 20,000 hours. No, look at this. Look at this graph. Okay. There's ancient Babylon, nothing. One hour for whale oil, five hours. The modern light bulb. Oh, they split it? It breaks off the graph. Oh, oh it, wow. Look at that. Holy cow. I, I literally wrote in my annotation, holy cow. Uh, I don't know how best to show this, but uh, it's just off the page. I mean, it's 4,000 times larger than the next largest yeah, one. Yeah. So <laughs> basically, it's like two years worth of electricity for or light for one day's work. And now the world as a whole is becoming wealthier. Mm. The entire world. And that's what trips people up a lot um, is this notion that like, jobs are being destroyed right like light bulb comes around jobs are being destroyed for whatever reason or robots are taking people's jobs yes in the short run but because of that everybody becomes wealthier it just takes a while right that's the issue is how long it takes and that's where these luddite mofos yes they're like we're not gonna go after people let's get those little rink dinky machines that are taking our little sewing jobs and they just go bashing around Mm -hmm. and they cause a that's an understatement yeah that was interesting too uh, what is it? Luddite? Luddite? Luddites. Wasn't it like one person? Judd Luddite? It wasn't even a real Ned, dude. <laughs> Ned Luddite. Right. It wasn't even a real person. Like they don't know. And then it just became these mobs of people. Like, and yeah. People and then the like Luddites. the business owners like, hey, stop fucking up my machines. And they started like mowing them down. It was madness. I think this was, was it 1600s or? I'm I don't totally know. I'm totally forgetting. Well, if it was post. Was it 1800s Light bulb, then yeah, we're. Oh. Uh, 19th century. Oh, it was after Industrial Revolution. Right. 1800s. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's some pushback, but basically, in general, long term, we're going to improve. Just sometimes people get screwed in the short term. Right. So it says right here, the industrial the industrial revolution suddenly makes it feel like everybody can have more money. The workers who lose their jobs to new machines violently disagree. Mm. Those are the Luddites. They're pissed. <laughs> That's going to be people driving trucks these days. So let's right. fast forward. We're getting into the modern ages. Uh, Belky, you're so antsy, but I love this shit. I'm not you antsy. Hate history. I... Definition yeah. of antsy yes. right there. Get out of here. Everybody. So let's also, uh, let's yeah. talk about modern money. 1776, book gets written. You know what it is? 1776? Mm-hmm. Book gets written? It's a pamphlet? Smithy. Adam Smith. Wealth of Nations. Mm. Bam, bam. And Haven't we, read it. We got Adam Haven't Smith. Haven't read it. Me neither. I've heard it recommended, <laughs> though. Oh. Adam Smith, he's building off this guy, Hume. The two of them have this idea, like, at the time... Nations thought they get rich because you hoard a bunch of gold and silver. And that means screw the trade because every time we trade, we're giving them our gold and silver. We want it all. But then they're like, you know, if you give your gold and silver, sure, they have it. But now there's less in your country. So everything within has to be less money. Right. So now your, your labor is cheaper. Everything's cheaper to buy. So this other is the countries. catch 22 with gold and other gold standard currencies is there is a finite amount of it. Mm. And so if you don't have it in your possession, then these wonky things start to happen. Which is interesting with Bitcoin because there is a finite number. Same thing. That's why it's like a gold standard. There's a fixed amount of Bitcoin that they're literally mining. And yeah, we'll get into the problem, especially with the Great Depression, why yeah, you, you've got to get off the gold standard. God, see, that's the antsiness. You can't rush this. They're going to two times speed it. You're in one time speed, all right? Here's what happens, all right? They're like, okay... People, it's just lower cost within the country. They're going to start buying. The gold comes back. It's going to get to equilibrium. Just want some water. Not your water. Not you will. your water. God, I'm the only one talking. 
because I'm the only one that reads. Sorry. All right. So basically, that that idea makes sense. Like, hey, we should actually trade with other countries. It's good for everyone. What they didn't consider is the problem with debt. Because say you now owe, like, say I don't know, you have India. You owe India like a hundred ounces of gold or something. Um, and then there's current like there's less money within your country. Now you have less money to pay India back and you're just going to be screwed. So they, they didn't really consider that it, it gets tricky. And that's why there's this whole, I feel like so many things just didn't get considered. I mean, how could you, right? The banking system gets, I mean, banking system, we've just been struggling with it for forever. Um, and now let's, let's kind of go to the national versus these little, little, uh, piping clover mm. banks all over the U S in the 1800s. That was a good little anecdote. Cause you go to the store in Illinois, right? You've, you've brought some Wisconsin currency and then you want to pay for something. They've got to like, look it up in the legal tender. And now that person in Illinois is stuck with your goofy little Wisconsin currency. At one point there were like 8,500 currencies in the United States. Yeah. Because they had, I think there was, his name was Biddle or some dude. Mm -hmm. Biddle was like, oh, we should have like the second U S bank or like one national bank. Jackson, he got screwed yeah. by the banks early 1800s. He's like, screw this, hates screw it. the Indians or natives. He hates everybody. And so he just wants to cancel that system. And what happens, there's no national bank. All these 8,000 8, plus regional banks come up and they have their IOUs as currency circulating all around. They can print whatever they want. And so, yeah, you're a store owner and a Henry comes in. And he's Did like, you? I got my Rhode Island coin. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, what the f***? Or he's like, oh, IOU currency. It's chaos until the civil war that's when the but that's union... when banking fees started because they had to charge a small right. fee to make it like okay somewhat reasonable that you paid in this rhode island coin in illinois it actually somehow jacob says it's like worked. not that much of a bitch it was yeah, like a one percent fee at it the was end less of the day. than inflation right now so it wasn't <laughs> that bad it was just madness i can't imagine like it's just what slow, that would be like. i'm sure so they civil war they're like hey we're the United States, we are the United States. That's a big distinction. It's, so that's the first time in history that we go from saying... Or United States... Is. It, it turns into is from are. Right. United States are. <laughs> yes. And then Civil War, United States is. Correct. So we, we come together as a whole. Confederacy loses their currency. And we start... That's when the dollar pops up. Where we're like, all right, let's do this thing. Um, it's kind of a funky system. Wait, this is really important, too. I wrote it down. Uh -huh. This is essentially the point where we realize that money, what did I say? Money makes a country a country. And that's part of the problem we run into in like 2007 onward in the EU, hmm. onward, onward, like 2011, um, is it's like once you have your currency, at least centralized like this, then you become a country or you can assume that identity. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because they talk about a little bit later with 21st or like the modern money stuff with uh, why the euro sucks compared to the dollar because they're just other countries. We'll, we'll get into that in a second. But uh, so, yeah, we have the dollar. There's this big debate of like William Jennings, I think, wanted silver. Some people want gold. Mm -hmm. Around 1900, they're like, we're going to do some gold standard. <clears throat> and basically, you can exchange 20 bucks for like an ounce of gold. Mm -hmm. And that's just what they roll with. Then uh, there's this panic in 1907 with the banks, and everyone's like, when you get nervous, you see one bank collapse, then everyone goes in, wants to get their gold, screw the money. It's madness. So then J.P. Morgan and his little bankers in New York, they're like, screw this, let's just make our own little bank. And they get on this train in the middle of the night pretending to go on a hunting trip. They have like pseudonyms oh, right. and everything. They've got and they guns go, and everything. They got everything, because they're going on a hunting <laughs> yeah. trip. They got to pretend. They're going to Georgia. But they really go to this Jekyll Island. That's when they cook up the Federal Reserve as like this semi- You figured it out. What? You oh, yeah. It out. Yeah, I figured it out. Uh, basically, yeah, the Federal Reserve. So it's like kind of a national bank, but it's a little bit more in checks and balances with like 12 of them. Um, so they make that. You have your, your one currency. It's a little bit more stable versus just chaos going on. They're going to control the supply. The problem, though, here's the problem. The Federal Reserve can print money, but not much. Mm -hmm. So for each, say, $10 you print, you need $4 in gold. So that means that when we get to 1929 and we have our little stock market bubble that suddenly collapses, everyone's losing their mind and they start going to the banks and like, you know what, 
uh, screw this. I just like, yeah. I, I want my, my gold or my money or whatever. Like banks just start collapsing because everyone's defaulting. Bringing in the coat checks. Here's. They're bringing check. their coat checks to the bank. Oh, they okay. Okay. Gotcha. They gotcha. Bring it in they the coat checks. They want their money back. Right. So here's the problem. Now everyone's just got the gold. There's no money in circulation, which is a problem because now you can't go out and buy things. And right. if businesses are not failing, they can't pay the banks their debt. And now the banks fail, and it's this death spiral. <laughs> so what do they do? Bank holidays. Just yeah, they're just closing like, up. Know, closing up shop. <laughs> you know, teller sign goes down. Which is cool because we still have those today. Right. Market will just close sometime. But uh, but yeah, basically it's a big problem, and it's partly because of this gold standard where everyone still hold the hoard the gold, and then plus the government's like, oh, here's how we're gonna fix it. Let's uh, drive up interest rates. And that's not what you... They're thinking like interest rates. Literally That'll wrong. get people to, you know, put their money back in the banking system. The banks will yeah. lend it. Complete opposite. Exactly Literally what you wrong. don't want to do. It happened in the EU too, I think. Uh, it rings Later a bell. on. They did the same thing. It's just, you don't want to do It's high school economics. So they basically screwed everything because there's less money. Because now you'll see a crisis. We print a shitload of money. They couldn't print money. And the reason, you know, more money in circulation, prices go up, everything's better. They couldn't do that. So then in 33, your boy FDR, he comes on his little fireside chat and he's like, fellas. Do you want me to read it like him? You, you know the quote? No, I, I, I could look it up and, and read it in oh. old time voice. You could put an effect over it. No, I, I, it's going to take too long. Okay. Uh, we're at 22. I don't know if this is going to be long enough. So you here's might have the, to cut that, for a third. That could be unprecedented. FDR is basically like, boys, we are, because he only talked to boys, boys, we are going to get rid of this gold standard. Screw it. We need to print money. We need to drive down inflation or interest rates, get inflation up. And that's what they do. But that's when he drops a bomb. The only thing to fear is fear itself. Yes. That's That's what what he does. But it's so important because money, the stock market, it's all speculation and trust. Mm. The only, I didn't know that. That's what he was referring to. The only thing to fear is fear itself in his fireside chat. Right. So just quit fearing. Like the government is <laughs> it here. Worked. Daddy's here. We got the FDIC now. We're going to back up your money. Don't go run in the bank because it's always going to be there. They officially break off in like 71, but that's that's like the, the mark from screw the gold standard. Now we get to 21st century. Let's see where we're at. We got our little uh, cash and money market scheme. Oh, yeah. You want to talk about that? Do you no, know I don't know what it? you're talking about. It's where, like, basically this money, like, currency just springs up from nowhere. And so they had these money market mutual funds. It was, like, pseudo it is. money. Yeah. But, like, it, it caused a crisis in oh wait, Basically, all this crazy money shenanigans. I don't fully understand the money market stuff. It, that, talks, it was the first mutual fund, right? And that kind of leads to this shadow banking. So here's, uh, yeah, we... We just have those issues. We have the euro. The euro sucks basically because you want countries to be able to print more money. And if you just have one currency for all of Europe, you you have clowns like Greece and Portugal and Ireland. Just so this is another around. amazing graph you probably didn't see. <laughs> but when they institute the euro, the interest rates start to coalesce into one rate. And they're like, great, it's working. Because people just trusted that the euro was a good idea. And then all of a sudden they're like, wait a minute. We don't know what the fuck they're doing in Spain. We don't know what those Greeks are doing. They're spending a lot of money. They're not working. And then the interest rates go. The funniest thing was in Greece. Apparently, there was this like team of 30 people. And they were getting paid a ridiculous amount of money to drain a lake. <laughs> right. And the lake was drained in 1957. <laughs> those Greeks, you can't trust them, let me tell you. So, yeah, you have, you know, those countries, then Spain and Italy start fucking around too. It's a mess. It's a mess. So, just... Screw the euro. It doesn't make sense. You need to control your own currency. Let's Again, get into gets, crypto. It gets back to the point that money is what makes a country a country. Right. And the EU's been battling with this for now. We've seen the last 20 years, 10, 20 years. What do you want to get in? Crypto? Hash cash? Crypto. So crypto. Crypto, it's this puzzle of like, okay, money only exists because we have trust. Right. We trust that the government or any third party is just backing up the money. Well, let's uh, let's use some technology. Maybe we can get these little computers. Screw the government. Let's figure out how code can be what we mm-hmm. trust, rather than people, because people suck. And so this was a difficult puzzle they've been not messing just people around. suck. They've realized 
yes, we live in a democracy. Money and banking, super undemocratic. Super undemocratic. Mm. It's a mess. So here comes a little democracy with cryptocurrency. And, and a big a big innovation in this field was through email and solving the problem of email spammers. Yes. This is super cool to me because I never, we didn't live through that age of like spam emails. But I guess like it doesn't cost money. So you could send millions of emails, just flood everyone. Until this one dude, I forget his name, was like, let's do this little thing called a hash. And a hash is like a little puzzle that increases the cost to send out an email because you have to solve it. Not super hard, but if you're doing it at scale, it's right. impossible. You, the average sender, sending one, two emails, like you just click, I'm not a robot. Right. Kind of like that. Kind of like that. So yeah, you, you have it. You, it's, it's hard to solve the puzzle, but people can tell like you're a human on the other side. So they use this technology in cryptocurrency. And we talked about this with Ian. Who knows what episode that is? But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's fascinating because now you have this world where... Wait, this is actually really cool because if you listen to that episode and you were, if you were us and you went through that episode, I felt like I knew so much about this chapter. Right. When a week ago, I knew nothing about blockchain. and. Uh, well, now I'm so much more into it because I realize right. all the problems, the history of money is just fraught. Like China screwed up 300 years, we're 300 years in, maybe it's going to get fucked. So you want something that you can trust. You can trust code because everyone can see it. You have this ledger, this blockchain of people, all these computers verifying a transaction. So you don't need humans at all. The issue is what we talked about with Ian. You can only do up to 15 transactions. It said five in the book, but it's a handful basically. And meanwhile, you have Wait, Visa. really quick. So I think you glossed over it, but we're solving hashes to combat email spam. And they realize like, Ah, uh, true. Sorry. Wait a minute. These hashes, let's call them hash cash, are act. They they take computing power. They take a resource to function, to solve to the solve puzzle. to solve the puzzle. Right. So, I thought it like in the sense that okay, if people are mining, like miners, mm. miner forty nine er, if they're mining for these hash caches, we're creating this thing that has scarcity mm. because some amount of energy has to go into the system. That's how we ultimately arrive at Bitcoin. That's why I'm forgetting his name, but he created Bitgold. He was on the Tim Ferriss show with Naval Ravikant. We'll link that. That was a really good episode for understanding Bitcoin. But yeah, so we use these puzzles. Now we have everyone competing to solve the puzzle. Once the puzzle is solved, it's very easy for everyone to verify that it happened. The block is just added to the chain, locked in history. The problem is you can only do so many transactions. It's not great to use like a Visa MasterCard that's doing tens of thousands. That's the problem. There's some splitting up within the community. You know, you have some people that want to create bigger blocks, but that's going to centralize because only big computers. Stop texting. Zach's here. All right, let's uh, let's wrap it up then. I want to know what you do. So the last chapter is kind of the three ways we can move forward. It's mm-hmm. a world without cash, a world without banks, which I'm a proponent of, or you get the AOC, Alexandria, Ocasio-Cortez, a world... We're, sorry, that's the title of the chapter. Modern Monetary Theory. Do you remember these? Yeah, Modern Monetary is basically screw where the money's coming from. Let's just like give people jobs. Yeah, it's like we've got all these people not working. We've got all these resources we can be using. So let's just print money, put them to work, and then things will balance out. It, and well, okay, so here's what happens. You print, print, print money. And then to cool that down, you have to tax. Mm. And that's why this is never going to work. It's because try convincing these old rich representatives that we should turn taxes on and off. I don't... I studied economics, but I have no idea what's going on. Macroecon is just so complex. So a world without banks. That's interesting. Very interesting. You have the reserve side, which is like, I give you the banks. Wait, really quick. So here are the two things that banks do. They hold our money and make it easier for us to get paid and make payments, and they make loans. Right. And I don't know if Goldstein synthesizes this, but he's basically like... Those should be two completely different things. Right. And so do you want it to just have the reserve bank? They hold your cash. Like the money saying, warehouse. And then the loan bank. And that way, you know, like your money's always going to be there. Right. So if, if we hold all of our money in, in money warehouses, that money isn't going into the shadow banking. It doesn't go anywhere. If you go to the money warehouse, you can always get your money back out. Right. Um. And then you allow the shadow banking to happen as a different... Well, yeah, you, you know entity. the risk you're getting into right. if you have a separate bank. I, I'm, I don't know. I haven't researched enough. That's a cool 
I like the segregation there. What uh, were the cons the first to doing one? that? Oh, people reinventing shadow banking. I yeah, it's, I feel it's like it came just, up naturally. People are always going to abuse whatever system there is. Yeah. Uh, there's no right answer. We've we've talked about three, four thousand years of history. There's no right answer. Bitcoin might be on the way though, because it is so democratic. That's uh, I think any takeaways. One, I'm excited about cryptocurrency more than ever. Uh, once we can solve this whole microtransactions stuff, it's going to be yeah, a it's game too changer. slow. The taxing thing is an issue. Like whatever the government taxes with, that usually becomes the currency. So I don't know what's going to happen there, but it's interesting enough to research. Then the idea that like whatever people believe, whatever the horde believes, the herd mentality, that's what's going to function. So right now there's more people in Bitcoin. That's why it's kind of starting to function a little bit. But, you know, you can't transact. That's it. That's money. Jacob Goldstein. We didn't talk mm. about um, Dread, Pirate Dread. What's that? Silk Road. Oh, the that... advent of the, the, kind of the, the, the oh, crummy side of. It's interesting because cash, like basically there are as many $1 bills as $100 bills. Like cash right now is only used for legal stuff. And it's kind of what the argument against Bitcoin or cryptocurrency is. It's like it's all anonymous for the most part. So a lot of bad stuff going we'll on see. Silk Road. All right, Belky, that was fun. Jacob, we're going to talk to you one day. You better prepare yourself. This is a great book. For Listen nonsense. to it or read it if you want to see the graphs. And we'll see you tomorrow for who knows what episode. <laughs> see <Peace>. ya. <laughs>